I'm really happy to be here today and, and to talk to you all about the work that we'll be doing. Um, and I'm especially thankful to the Staglin family for their support. This has been such a wonderful experience so far, and I'm excited to tell you about the work that we're going to be doing uh, with this support. So my laboratory is, is very interested in the cellular and molecular mechanisms of bipolar disorder. Um, we know this is a, a terrible disorder that affects around 2.5% of the population in the United States. This means about 1 in 40 people are affected by this disease. It's extremely disabling. Um, it causes swings from mania to, to severe depression, um, causes problems with jobs and personal relationships. Um, and ultimately, what we know is, is around 50% of those that are affected uh, end up commit, trying to commit suicide during their life. And of those, 5 to 10% of them are successful. So this is a, a severe mental health problem in the country. And we also know that current therapies don't work for most of our patients. So they often take a long time to be treated. And during this time, every episode that they have increases the likelihood of future episodes and also increases the severity of future episodes. So this is a major problem that we need to solve. And to do so, I think we need to take a look at what is happening under the hood, what's happening inside the brain in bipolar disorder so we can identify new pathways to discover new treatments. So what we do know about bipolar disorder so far is that it's extremely heritable disease. So if you have a family member with bipolar disorder, there's about a 50% chance that you'll be affected. If you have an identical twin with the disorder, there's about 80% chance you'll be in, uh, affected. And so because of this, there's been lots of interest in looking at the genomes of patients with bipolar disorder. And this is a, a recent example of tens of thousands of patients where they've looked for genes that are significant. And these, these green dots across the dotted line represent areas of the genome that are significantly associated with disease. And one of the, the most commonly associated is a gene called ANC3. And this happens to be the gene that, that we study in our lab. So ANC3 gives rise to the protein ANCRIN G. And ANCRIN G builds two critically important domains within the neuron, the axon initial segment and the nodes of Ranvier. And these are the places where neuronal signals are converted into electrical activity that is sent down the length of the axon. And we've known about this function of ANCRIN for about 20 years. What we do know about neurons as well is that these neurons don't operate in isolation. They're in networks. And so, for example, here on the right is a section through a mouse brain. And each one of these green dashes is an axon initial segment from a neuron in that slice. And if you allowed these neurons to just act on their own, what you would see is they would just act randomly or stochastically, and they, were, they would fire like this. But there is a special class of neuron that expresses a marker protein called parvalbumin. This neuron releases an inhibitory neurotransmitter called GABA, and its job, it, the reason it's exciting is because this neuron synapses onto hundreds or even thousands of axon initial segments and acts to synchronize these neuronal networks. So now these neurons fire together. And it's this, uh, this consolidated uh, firing that leads to something called gamma oscillations. And so these are higher order executive function gamma oscillations within the brain that we can see on EEGs. And what we know is that within bipolar disorder patients and in other psychiatric diseases, this class of neuron, the parvalbumin neuron, and their connections, as well as these gamma oscillations, are often impacted. So during work in my postdoc with Van Bennett, we found a brand new role for anchorin outside of the axon initial segment and nodes of Ranvier, and that is informing these inhibitory connections. So these parvalbumin neurons synapse onto other neurons, and we found that anchorin plays a role in these synapses. And you can see these synapses if you stain a neuron in culture with a marker for synapses, in this case in red. You can see each one of these dots is a place where a neuron is connecting, an inhibitory neuron is connecting onto this cell. And what we learn is that when you delete the ANC3 gene, we lose these synapses. There's a striking loss of the inhibitory connections um, and also changes in gamma oscillations consistent with the loss of network synchronization. But one of the difficulties with studying this gene was that when we knocked this out, although we could identify this brand new role for the protein, the animals died around 21 days after birth. So this made it very difficult to study what was actually happening. How does this correlate with behavior? How can we modulate these things uh, with therapeutics? And so to overcome this limitation, we used a, a variety of biochemical and molecular techniques to identify the mechanism by which Ankerin was controlling these synapses. And we found a very important interaction with a protein called GABARAP, and we could use tools to selectively mutate an amino acid. In this case, it's a, the amino acid 
tryptophan 1989. And when we mutated this amino acid, we selectively lost the inhibitory connections without impacting the other functions of the gene. And this finally gave us a great tool to where we could separate the functions of the anchor and G protein in an animal that lives into adulthood, and we could see what happens. And in the end, what we saw, as you see in the pictures, is decreases in inhibitory connections, changes in gamma oscillations and alterations in excitation inhibition balance. So this models a lot of the things that we see in psychiatric diseases, and based on what we saw in these mice, we predicted that perhaps this would be important in people too. So to test for this, um, I took advantage of my collaborators at the University of Michigan and the Heinz Prechter Bipolar Research Program, and we actually looked at the genomes of the bipolar patients in our cohort. We have about 1,300 patients in our cohort, uh, 600 of which are bipolar, and we actually found one of our patients that carried the same exact mutation that we made biochemically. And this patient was bipolar, and we were very lucky and, and thankful to the, to the patients that we were able to go back and contact the family and see if there were any other additional family members that were affected. And what we found is there were actually three immediate family members that all carry this mutation, and all three of them are affected by bipolar disorder. So now we have a mouse model and a human family that we can use to understand what is happening with inhibitory circuitry and how do drugs work on this system. And so we had a hypothesis that when you lose anchor and G function, you get forebrain hyperexcitability and you lose network synchronization. And we thought that perhaps the drugs that these patients were taking would actually work on this system to improve it. And so the first aim of, of the grant uh, that we're gonna be performing is to understand what the drugs that these patients are taking and in addition to other bipolar disorder therapeutics do to this system. And so we, based on our contact with the families, we were able to identify all the current therapies they were taking. Um, all three of them are on benzodiazepines, two of them are on lamotrigine, and one is on lithium. And all of these drugs work either directly or indirectly on GABAergic neurotransmission. So we thought that was very interesting. In addition, we recently published a paper with Chris Ross at Johns Hopkins where he had a forebrain model of ANG3 deletion, and that mouse had a number of behavioral deficits. And all of those deficits that we looked at uh, were restored with either lithium or valproate treatment. And so we wanted to see what lithium and valproate and some of these other drugs were actually doing to anchor independent circuits. So the first set of experiments we did is we actually treated mice with lithium for the same time course that we used in the behavioral experiments. And what we see is a, a striking reversal of some of the GABAergic inhibitory signaling defects that we see in our mouse. So for this aim, we're actually going to expand this work into the other drugs that the patient families are taking in addition to valproate and see if we can identify what signaling pathways are altered. Are these working presynaptically on the parvalbumin neurons or postsynaptically on the downstream cells so that we can more accurately figure out what these drugs are doing so hopefully better identify drugs in the future. Well, one of the struggles in psychiatry has been that mice aren't small people. And so it's, it's difficult sometimes to model these things in mice. And so what we've done is actually gone back to the patients. And so because of the way our, our IRB protocol is set up, we can go back to the patient families and we can take just a simple biopsy from the skin. And we can grow these skin cells in a dish, and we can add reprogramming factors into the dish and turn them into induced pluripotent stem cells. And then we can turn these stem cells, stem cells into a variety of other cell types, but importantly, we can turn these cells into neurons. So now you have a neuron, a nerve cell, with the exact genetic background of the patients that you're looking at, and you can see what is actually happening, and does it correspond to what we, we see in mice? And so this is a, an example. These are pictures of neurons from the original patient that we identified. So these are neurons carrying that ANC3 tryptophan to arginine variant. So in the second aim of this grant, we're going to be looking at what the same drugs that the patients are taking do to signaling, and do we see the same signaling defects in human neurons that we, we see in the mice? So ultimately, the goal in our lab is to take all of this information and combine it with the other types of work that's going on in the Heinz, uh, Heinz Practor Bipolar Research Program to really identify new pathways and new targets for the treatment of psychiatric disease. Right now, uh, patient compliance is a major issue because side effects are terrible, so hopefully if we can more selectively target the pathways involved in, in disease, we can make the patient experience much better. So with that, I have to acknowledge, of course, uh, the people in my lab. So this is predominantly the work of a graduate student and postdoc in my lab. Um, they have done a, just a fantastic job on this project, and I'm really excited to see where it's going in the future. 
I also have to thank the Heinz Practor Bipolar Research Program for providing me access to patient samples and, and clinical information, especially Melvin McGinnis. Um, all my other collaborators, and of course I'd like to, to thank OneMind for supporting this work. We're very excited about this going forward and hoping that we can help people in the future.